Michael Schellenberger caused a mini storm among climate campaigners and scientists. He said, on behalf of environmentalists everywhere, I apologise for the climate scare we created over the last 30 years. Skeptics are ecstatic. Campaigners are livid. What's it all about? Well, let's have a look. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Those of you who watch my videos regularly will know that I talk about climate change often and I try to follow the science, which generally ends up in calling out cherry picking and distortions, both from the extreme skeptics, but also the extreme environmentalist campaigners. So when I saw Michael Schellenberger's forthcoming book, Apocalypse Never, it looked very much in the same spirit. I assumed this would be an interesting contribution possibly controversial amongst the extremists, generally welcomed by the rest, including the climate science community. And then marketing happened. Specifically, marketing in the form of a Forbes article titled, on behalf of environmentalists everywhere, I apologise for the climate scare. As you can imagine, that's a title that grabs the attention. And it grabbed the attention, like a 10-ton gorilla grabbing the assembled climate community by the scruff of the neck. And there has been some furious commentary over the last few days as a result. Some of it focused on the politics of the message. A lot of it focused on the scientific statements that were made in the article. Very little focused on the marketing approach and what was really going on. So... Let's quickly see if we can cover all of that. First of all, a quick summary of Schellenberger's article. And I'm paraphrasing by necessity, hopefully in so doing, not changing the meaning of anything he says. I provided a link to the full article in the video description and I encourage you to read the full thing for yourself. First, he offers his credentials as someone who is a long-term environmentalist, a climate activist for 20 years, he says. We environmentalists misled the public. He then gives a list of 12 facts that few people know. Which of these? Let's do the whole list. Humans are not causing a sixth mass extinction. The Amazon is not the lungs of the world. Climate change is not making natural disasters worse. Fires have declined by 25% around the world since 2003. The amount of land we use for meat, which is humankind's biggest use of land, has declined by an area nearly as large as Alaska. The build-up of wood fuel and more houses near to forests, not climate change, explain why there are more and more dangerous fires in Australia and California. Carbon emissions are declining in most rich nations and have been declining in Britain, Germany and France since the mid-1970s. The Netherlands became rich, not poor, while adapting to life below sea level. We produce 25% more food than we need and food surpluses will continue to rise as the world gets hotter. Habitat loss and the direct killing of wild animals are bigger threats to species from climate change. Wood fuel is far worse for people and wildlife and fossil fuels. And finally, preventing future pandemics requires more, not less, industrial agriculture. He then gives some backstory to show how much of an environmental activist he's been all of his life, which seems entirely fine. I mean, he's slightly talking it up for storytelling effect, but, you know, that's marketing. And then he says he began to have a turning point as certain environmentalists, like Bill McKibben, began to ramp up the climate rhetoric. Children were beginning to have nightmares and he decided that enough was enough. He then says he wrote his apology in the form of a book. Marketing, remember? I think I mentioned that. And he makes a number of provocative statements that arise from it, including things like factories and modern farming are the keys to human liberation and environmental progress, the most important thing for reducing pollution and emissions is moving from wood to coal to petrol to natural gas to uranium. 100% renewables would require increasing the land used for energy from today's 0.5% to 50%. And so on. 
He then promises at the end of the book he will expose the financial, political and ideological motivations of environmental campaign groups that led them to mislead people in this way. Incidentally, soon after the article going live, it was actually pulled by Forbes from their website. Schellenberger and various climate sceptic blogs were quick to allege censorship. Reportedly, Forbes said they pulled it because it broke their rules on self-promotional content. Now, as I've possibly suggested already, it is a pretty hard sell on Schellenberger's book. And he does have plenty of articles still live on Forbes that are in the same vein as this one in terms of the message. So I don't see why an independent observer would jump to the conclusion that it's actually censorship and not what they say it is. But of course, for a piece of marketing, nothing works better than some attempted censorship. The book they don't want you to read. Those are my words, not his, by the way. And the article was duly reproduced on numerous websites in the wake of it disappearing from Forbes, including The Spectator. So not just the climate sceptic blogs. And of course, that happened because it was a hugely provocative title. And to, so alleged censorship makes it all the more interesting. Now, in the article itself, he aims blows at environmentalists, but not at climate scientists. He quotes several climate scientists giving praise for the book, although he does make a passing comment about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for allowing the science to become politicised. So you take from that that the hope was that the climate science community would affirm the facts that he quotes and that the book would therefore be a swat at the campaigners whose claims have become disconnected from the actual science. And, you know, I've more quietly done some of that on this channel. And there are certainly some of these statements of fact that I recognise from the research that I've done for videos here and that I've indeed talked about in those videos, such as the argument that we are not, in spite of what some of the campaigners say, in the middle of a sixth mass extinction. And that habitat loss is currently what's driving species loss, not climate change, and a number of the others. However, the reaction by some of the most vocal climate scientists on Twitter was immediate and hostile. And by vocal, of course, we're talking about some of those who have blurred the line between being scientists and being campaigners in their own right. So they responded negatively, first and foremost, because of the attack on the climate campaigning community. As far as I could see, not trying to be a mind reader, that was because they wholly and fully associate the climate science community with the campaigners. So Michael Mann called Schellenberger a fake green and called the book Soft Climate Denialism Inactivist Propaganda. Tweets that he later apparently deleted. But he did later retweet one that said, This guy is like the Matryoshka doll of climate denial, packing multiple pieces of dis and misinformation inside each other, and finally, when you get to the core, it's empty. Which is just name-calling, really. I mean, I was pretty surprised at that. Schellenberger doesn't dispute the IPCC reports, but sure, call him a denier because you disagree with him. I, I don't use the label denier on this channel. I'm not a fan of name calling. That means that you don't have to engage with people's arguments. You can just consign them to a pile. That means you don't even have to talk to them. But in any case, if you're going to start attributing such labels to people who don't actually deny the science, then we're getting into a difficult place. I mean, aren't we? Others pointed out that climate sceptics were jumping on the piece and suggested that that told you all you needed to know. Well, not really, no. Sometimes people who disagree on one thing will agree on another. Catherine Hayhoe tweeted a link to a paper simply saying, science says humans are causing the sixth extinction. Now, these are campaign responses, not scientific responses. No doubt the sceptics in turn would suggest that tells you all you need to know. But let's step aside from the heat of a moment and take a more considered look. The thing that created the pushback was the positioning first and foremost. Because it comes down to your position, how much do you equate the full-on alarmism of groups like Extinction Rebellion with the findings of the mainstream science, as summarised by the IPCC reports? 
Schellenberger points out that many of his facts are affirmed by the IPCC, so it doesn't seem that his original intent was to cast a shade on the mainstream science. But for some of the sceptics, including perhaps some with the ear of the President of the United States, it's all the same thing. Now, Zeke Hausfather said this, while it's useful to push back against claims that climate change will lead to the end of the world, doing so by inaccurately downplaying real climate risks is deeply problematic and counterproductive. And that comes down to Schellenberger's ultimate conclusion. He says, climate change is happening. It's just not the end of the world. It's not even our most serious environmental problem. He believes that a shift to nuclear power will be a significant part of the solution, while the 100% renewables hopes that campaigners have are unrealistic and will have numerous negative consequences. And of course, I've argued with climate campaigners on here before about the suggestion that climate change is the end of the world. But by wrapping the arguments up in a layer that says, my apologies on behalf of everyone for alarmism, it's not an unreasonable misrepresentation when a lot of people interpret that as saying nothing to worry about, no need to do anything, which is why all the fire and fury. Interestingly, though, the scientists that felt the need to respond, well, they responded like campaigners, not like scientists. Rather than acknowledge facts that were correct, draw attention to inaccuracies where they existed and reiterating what the IPCC agrees with in terms of implications for action, they really went after the article with the intention of debunking it. The fact-checking website Climate Feedback was one of the main vehicles for this. It commissioned a number of scientists to comment and ended up giving it a rating of low scientific credibility, which is pretty damning. And that kind of matters because, first of all, Climate Feedback website is pretty influential in its own right. But then even more importantly, it's used by Facebook for its own purposes. And it turns out that this rating meant that Facebook slapped a notice onto copies of Schellenberg's article describing it as factually inaccurate. Now, I've quoted climate feedback before, once approvingly, when various scientists on its pages show the misrepresentations of science behind the uninhabitable Earth article. But then rather less happily, recently, when they did a hit job on Susan Crockford, who focuses on polar bear populations, and the scientists they used to do the rating were ones who had a history of negative interactions with the person being rated, which you would have to suggest was an undeclared conflict of interest. And as I mentioned in the video that I did it on, they gave references in support of statements that when you checked out the sources, did not actually support the statements. So, one good, one bad, how did they do here? They said this, as the reviewers described below, several of these claims are accurate or partially accurate. However, others are inaccurate and mislead readers by lacking context and cherry picking data while overlooking other relevant scientific studies. OK, well, it sounds sort of nuanced. What are the point of contentions? The ones deemed significant enough to mention in the introductory paragraph are the point about being in the sixth mass extinction. So maybe I was wrong about that and we'll need to go back and do a correction, which I'm always happy to do. Whether climate change is making natural disasters worse and whether wildfires have decreased in recent years and therefore are not affected by climate change. A first class, the first one is a question of definition. The other two are about evidence for current harm none of which seem to prove or disprove any contentions about the future impacts of climate change and what are the best policy approaches, which is the core of his message. Looking at each in turn, when I did videos on extinction questions, I'd come across the discussion about the sixth mass extinction and I'd seen that IPBES, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and other credible figures said that what we currently have does not fulfil the criteria for being in the middle of a sixth mass extinction. The point is that in such a mass extinction, as we've seen in geological history, you're in a cascading series of consequences that once they're in train are impossible to stop. 
What we've actually seen to date is that as we reduce habitats, so the overall numbers of creatures decline in line with the reduction. This has been less about actual extinctions than early computer models predicted, but there has been a significant reduction in biomass. And, you know, that's a problem. If you Let's put it this way. If you killed off six out of seven billion of the human beings that are on the planet, the species would not have gone extinct, yet still say something pretty bad had just happened. We've also found that when habitats are restored, then nature expands back into the space, which is the good news. So that doesn't mean that we may not be pushing close to a threshold. It doesn't mean that at some point future climate change might not become a bigger factor than it currently is with knock-on effects. There's absolutely no grounds whatsoever for complacency. But we're not in the middle of a mass extinction. That's what the IPBES says. And indeed, Schellenberger quotes a conversation he himself had on this point with Joseph Settle, the co-chair of IPBES, he asked, is it scientifically accurate to say humans are causing a sixth great extinction? And he reportedly said, it's not. We don't say that. But not everyone agrees. The paper that Catherine Hayhoe was quoting on the subject was won by Gerardo Ciballos, Paul Ehrlich and Rodolfo Derzo. And it turns out that Ciballos is one of the scientists asked by Climate Feedback to respond to Schellenberger's paper and the one who talks mostly about the extinction point. As far as he's concerned, all you need to do is to show that the current extinction rate is well above what's described as the natural rate of extinction. And if it is, then it's clearly human-caused and deserving of the title. I may have over-paraphrased that. I don't want to misrepresent it. But what becomes clear is that at the very least... There is a legitimate debate about this in the scientific community. And indeed, Zeke Hausfather acknowledged this in a Twitter thread where he added on the subject. He, he said, I'm not a huge fan of the six mass extinction framing and note that I didn't comment on that particular part in my review. So wait, that point is sufficiently under dispute that not all of the reviewers agreed with it. How can it therefore be presented with the certainty of a fact check? The IPBES, which is a major body in this area, doesn't think it applies. In its 2018 report, it used phrases such as pushing the planet towards the sixth extinction, which you would therefore take to be the orthodox view of the science. But Climate Feedback invites the author of a single paper who has a different view, whose contributions don't acknowledge that uncertainty at all. And this is where I find myself beginning to have some serious worries about what the climate feedback site is doing. In principle, it's a really useful functional idea. There has to be robustness about who gets invited on what basis and what's the brief for their contribution. Is it about people who can summarise what's the current scientific understanding? Or is it people who can state their own well-informed opinion or their own research without placing it into any context. Because if it's the latter, fine, that's a useful debate and discussion site, but not what Facebook should be using for fact-checking. Now, the second item is about natural disasters and whether or not climate change has played any part in the increases of such disasters to date. Schellenberger says not. He bases this on declining rates of deaths from natural disasters as well as economic damage. Zeke Howe's father replied to this in the article by saying this, Schellenberger's claims that climate plays no role in natural disasters and wildfires fly in the face of a large peer-reviewed scientific literature showing clear links between climate change and extreme heat events, drought and extreme rainfall. In response, Schellenberger pointed out that this was confusing two different things. He said that natural disasters with the extreme disruption and damage to human society that's associated with that term, that's not the same as extreme heat events, which don't lead to such disaster. That seems like a valid distinction in its own terms. You might well argue that actually the extreme weather events do matter, and there's a good argument to be made, but it's not the counter to the point that Schellenberger actually made, because it's not what he was talking about. Now, the IPCC in this case agrees with Schellenberger. It says this, apart from detection, loss trends have not been conclusively attributed to anthropogenic climate change. Most such claims are not based on scientific attribution methods. However, Catherine Hayhoe pointed out that there is at least one such attribution, to be fair, one published well after the IPCC report that was quoted, which was a paper published in April this year that suggested that part of the damages from Hurricane Harvey 
could be attributed to climate change. This could well be a fair riposte. The overall numbers of hurricanes have not increased because of climate change, or indeed at all, but it's expected that such events would be made more intense. So it's feasible that this has been the case with Hurricane Harvey. It certainly hadn't been shown to be the case before then, but could well be the first one. How well settled such attribution science is, is an open question, but certainly it should nibble away at the bold certainty of claims, either way. Schellenberger's claim was not hedged or nuanced, so maybe that doesn't survive research that took place after he finished the book. The third item was to do with wildfires. Schellenberger said fires have declined 25% around the world since 2003. Housefather said this statement is accurate but misleading. The vast majority of fires globally are purposefully set for agricultural clearing and these have declined in recent years. Conflating all fires with forest and wildfires, as Schellenberger does, is not helpful in understanding changing drivers of fire risk. Schellenberger responded that he did not conflate all fires with forest and wildfires. And that seems a fair point. I mean, I've said before, I'm not that interested in the issue of wildfires as a proxy indicator for climate change because there are other things that can affect them. Nevertheless, it was part of what Schellenberger said and it was one of the things they responded to. I think certain people thought that the context implied certain things and I agree that there's an ambiguity about how some of these statements were phrased. I mean, take the natural disasters point, for instance. Lots of people understood it in the way that the scientists did. Technically, they were wrong to do so. Schellenberger uses his language precisely. But generally, as a professional communicator, as he is, if lots of people misunderstand something you say, generally you should assume it's your problem as the communicator, unless there's evidence that they're doing so in bad faith. There are a number of things that made it onto the climate feedback article that didn't apparently come from a piece under scrutiny. For instance, Zeke Housefather says this, Schellenberger also falls into the trap of seeing a single technology, nuclear, as the one true solution to climate change and mistakenly sees denigrating other clean energy technologies as the best way to promote it. The real world involves messy trade-offs and uncertainties and decarbonisation will involve a range of different technological solutions across industries and geographies rather than a single panacea. Now, I would personally agree with that statement, but first of all, it's an opinion. It's not a scientific fact check. That's a debate about policy. And here's the thing. Schellenberger doesn't actually make that argument in the article being reviewed. Zeke is commenting on what he knows of Schellenberger's position. With respect, that's not the job of a fact-checking article. And this is part of the problem. Zeke Hausfather is connected to the Breakthrough Institute. Schellenberger was a key part of the Institute. They didn't part on the best of terms. Even though Zeke clearly aims to be fair to the facts. Again, was Zeke Hausfather really the right choice of a commenter? for such a fact-checking piece. I mean, I follow Zeke Hausfather. I have no doubts at all about his personal integrity. And I know that he doesn't have personal history with Schellenberger, but does it make sense to have commentary from organisations that do have such a history? Especially when that history is not disclosed in the article. So look, my conclusion on the facts of all of this is that the fact-checking article did not do a great job of showing the things that Schellenberger quoted here were, according to the mainstream settled science, low scientific credibility. Rather, with great regret, I'm of a view that it has brought the concept of that site into some disrepute. So that's for fact-checking. What about the tone of the article? Well, look, it's a pure marketing pitch aimed at one side of the debate, the sceptic side. And the sceptics have lapped it up and amplified the message. Sales of a book are doing extremely well as a result. It's an example of great marketing, which is not a shocker because Schellenberger has had a marketing role in the past. The aim has been to engage those wanting to kick back against the genuine harmful alarmism and the non-campaigning scientists should be on board with that as well to bring them to a more helpful centre for scepticism. Acceptance of the scientific reality, human-caused climate change, is a thing, but it's not anything like what Extinction Rebellion and even sometimes the BBC says that it is. Now, I always preach against mind-reading other people's intentions, so you might be saying, come on, Malin, how do you know that was the intention? 
I don't know it for sure, but it's certainly what was said in a Twitter exchange with Schellenberger's publisher. He had a cancel culture Twitter user attacking him for daring to publish a book and give Schellenberger a platform. I mean, really? You think your opinions are so damned important they should be imposed on the world with no room for argument? Anyway, his publisher argued like this. You're thinking of this all wrong. This book argues climate change is a 100-year problem, not a 10-year problem. You're imagining people who think it's a 10-year problem reading it. Not one will. Not one. The people buying it right now don't even believe it's a 100-year problem. They think it's a hoax. You should be happy if those people read this and start believing it's real, even if they think dams and nuclear are the solution. On that basis... Schellenberg's article and overall marketing is clearly consistent, following a logical strategy and by all evidence effective. A concern people have is whether the headline means that lots of people will be told that an environmentalist has come clean and that's proof that climate change is a hoax. And I've seen Twitter people saying that. But to be fair, those people are not reading the book, they're not that nuanced. The guy who I saw most recently who tweeted that has been saying that all sorts of things prove that it's a hoax. It's by no means clear that there will be more of those people as a result of this marketing. There might be. It's a fair challenge to say it's not ethical to put out a statement apologising on behalf of all environmentalists, knowing full well that environmentalists would reject your characterisation of them in the strongest possible terms. Of course, it's polemical. Of course, nobody takes it literally. And, you know, it has been extremely effective. Does that make it right? Well, let's just say it's a grey area arguable both ways. I'm personally not a huge fan of the end justifies the means types arguments, but then that's probably why Schellenberger's a best-selling author, and I'm not. In any event, it should be welcomed, in my view, as a provocative contribution to needed and important debates about the detail of how we understand the science and what we think we should be doing as a result. The people whose reactions to that is to circle the wagons and fight it off are blurring the line between upholding the integrity of the science and turning it instead into an unquestionable orthodoxy that punishes all critiques or question. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it. It means you should be able to accept such opinions with respect and discuss and debate them. Those are my thoughts. Let me know what you think in the comments below.